Uh, my name is Alex Zambelli. I'm a, a technical evangelist for the Microsoft Media Platform. And uh, probably the first question on your mind today might be, what is the Microsoft Media Platform? It's a term that we haven't been, really been using necessarily for a long time. You know, we've been uh, developing a lot of media technologies in Microsoft over the past uh, several years, uh, and some of them independently, and then some of them, you know, to work together. And so, uh, you know, we've always been using them uh, to, to really to build media solutions. Uh, and so we come to think of them really as, as a media platform, and we decided, you know, we should really put together sort of an umbrella brand for these set of technologies. So that's really what Microsoft Media Platform is. It's an umbrella brand for a set of Microsoft uh, technologies that you use to uh, encode, uh, deliver, protect, uh, playback video, really to build internet media streaming solutions. And so the Microsoft Media Platform really encompasses a number of, of other uh, Microsoft technologies that you might know by other names. Uh, this is a, a good overview, for example, of what goes into the Microsoft Media Platform. Um, probably starting from the, uh, what I would consider, I guess, the, the, the uh, first step in the, in the path of delivering and building a media solution will be the services, you know, uh, basically how do we deliver the media. And so uh, today we have two uh, primary components that we use to deliver uh, media, uh, um, two Microsoft components that we use to deliver media. That would be Windows Server uh, uh, and using IIS Media Services. That's our on-premise technology for, uh, for building media servers. And then we have Windows Azure, which is uh, becoming more and more important as we transition to the cloud. Uh, we have a set of tools for encoding uh, media. Uh, so we have uh, Microsoft Expression Encoder, for example, which is our in-house encoder tool. And then we also have PlayReady DRM, uh, which we use to encrypt and protect content. Uh, and uh, then we have a set of client technologies that we use typically to play back this media on once we deliver it. Uh, we've been using Serverlet a lot for the past few years. Uh, as, HTML, as HTML5 is emerging, we're uh, obviously embracing that and adding that to our uh, set of uh, client technologies as well. And then, uh, especially in the context of uh, smooth streaming, which I'm going to just uh, touch uh, a little bit uh, upon later, uh, we've also developed a number of uh, porting kits, the Smooth Streaming Porting Kit and Play Ready Porting Kit to really enable delivery of adaptive streaming media, protected adaptive streaming media to platforms such as uh, iOS and Android and uh, other uh, you know, uh, platforms such as set-top boxes, for example. And then finally, the last piece of the Microsoft Media Platform is our frameworks. Uh, we realized that having products out there is not enough because a lot of times if you put just an encoder product out there and a server product out there, there's not necessarily things to connect them together to really solidify that workflow. And so what we've been doing over the years is building a number of frameworks that make uh, the process of building media uh, streaming solutions a lot easier. So one of them, for example, is our uh, Microsoft Media Platform Video Editor, which we use to, uh, to essentially do rough cut edits of uh, smooth streams uh, that are already in the cloud, so you don't have to go and actually re-encode highlights. You can just reference them uh, in a playlist and then play that directly from the cloud. Uh, we have a content manager solution, which is a very basic uh, CMS framework. Uh, we have a player framework uh, that we basically use for uh, building uh, uh, rich media players. Uh, rather than having you start from scratch, you can just start from the framework uh, and start from a much uh, more functional level. And then finally, there's the audience insight framework, which we use to, uh, to essentially analyze and interpret uh, media usage data. And so that's what we consider today the components of the Max Microsoft Media Platform. Now, this session today is about HTML5 and how HTML5 fits into the Microsoft Media Platform. And so before we consider which components of this that you see on the screen go into you know, our HTML5 world, we have to you know, think about HTML5 and certain constraints that come along with HTML5. Uh, if you had a chance to read the HTML5 video specification, and I encourage you to do so, uh, obviously, if you're here, you have an interest in HTML5, and it's really uh, useful to actually read the spec and know what's in it and what's not, and kind of read through a lot of the uh, uh, you know, reports and, 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 and uh, blogs and so on that have been you know, talking about HTML5 for the, for the past several years. Uh, the HTML5 video specification really addresses only a, a basic set of video delivery scenarios. Uh, some might refer to this as the, the YouTube scenario or the, the user-generated content scenario. Because we're typically talking about, you know, what, what's HTML5 video good for? It's really good for the type of scenarios where you have 
uh, basically just progress the download of, uh, of a media file uh, that doesn't require uh, DRM protection, doesn't require adaptive streaming, doesn't require live streaming. And that's because uh, if you read the HTML5 uh, video spec, you notice that there are some key features actually missing from the, the specification, such as uh, there's no actual traditional video streaming uh, that's addressed in the spec. So there's no RTSP or proprietary technology such as uh, RTMP or anything like that referenced in the spec. Uh, there's no reference of HTTP adaptive streaming uh, in the specification. And there's also no mention of content protection, so there's no form of digital rights management in there. Uh, a lot of people uh, have been using, for example, Apple HLS uh, to deliver to HTML5 on uh, iOS devices such as the iPads and the iPhone. And so a lot of people tend to think, you know, when we say, oh, there's no HTTP adaptive streaming in HTML5, they go, well, what about HLS? I've been using that to deliver to uh, iPads. And uh, the thing there is that uh, Apple HLS is actually not a part of the HTML5 spec. It's just a proprietary standard, just a proprietary <coughs> extension of uh, Apple's implementation of the Safari browser. So that's actually not part of the specification. So for all intents and purposes, really the, the, the scenarios that we're looking at uh, uh, for HTML5 is really progressive download of unprotected clear video uh, on demand. So if basically if that's the scenario uh, that, that's interesting to you, then HTML5 is a suitable answer for you. If uh, you want to do more, if you want to do live streaming, if you want to do uh, protected content, then you probably want to be looking at you know, some of the other technologies, client technologies such as Flash or Serverlight or others. So coming back to the Microsoft Media Platform, now that we know what the constraints of HTML5 are, let's kind of take a look at what components of the Microsoft Media Platform actually are applicable uh, to the HTML5 context. So first one will be uh, Windows Server and IS Media Services. Uh, IIS is the web server of, uh, of Windows Server, uh, and that's what we would use, obviously, to deliver progressively downloaded uh, media to an HTML5 browser. Uh, we need to encode that media somehow, so Microsoft Expression Encoder is still applicable here. Um, of course, obviously, we're going to be talking about HTML5 today on the client side, and we're going to be talking about specifically about Internet Explorer as Microsoft's implementation of the HTML5 browser. And then finally, of the frameworks, the most interesting one to us is going to be the player framework because we've done some work there to add HTML5 capability to our player framework as well. So let's talk about the Internet Explorer first. Uh, the latest version of Internet Explorer is Internet Explorer 9, and that's been around since March of this year. Uh, in uh, IE9, we added support for HTML5 video and audio tags. And that means uh, we have uh, native H.264, AAC, MP4 file support in there. Uh, if you are interested in WebM playback, uh, Google's WebM standard, uh, I shouldn't say standard, Google's WebM uh, uh, implementation, uh, there's actually a plugin for Internet Explorer that you can download that enables playback of WebM in Internet Explorer 2. But today we're going to be focused on H.264 H264 because that's what we natively support in uh, Internet Explorer. One of the big advantages of H.264 uh, and you know, why we prefer the Internet Explorer is because we actually have full hardware acceleration of H.264 decode working in the Internet Explorer. That means that when you play back any H.264 video in the Internet Explorer in HTML5, you actually, uh, it's not the CPU doing the decode, really uh, the entirety of the, uh, the video decode is actually being done by the GPU, by the uh, video card. Uh, why is that important? It's really important because it reduces power consumption. And that in turn reduces, uh, I'm sorry, extends battery life on uh, mobile devices and, uh, and laptops and so on. And so today we're increasingly using more and more netbooks and slates and such devices uh, of that form factor. And it's really important that they can handle HD video, which is becoming the norm for you know, delivery of video over the internet. Uh, uh, if we were just up to you know, playing video on the desktop, we really probably wouldn't be talking about hardware acceleration as being such a big deal because today most, uh, most desktops have dual core, quad core, even you know, more cores than, uh, than four. Uh, and so they can actually really easily handle HD video, even 1080p video in full resolution, uh, just decoding it on the CPU. But when we talk about the, the, the uh, devices such as netbooks, the typically low power devices that typically use 
uh, Intel Atom uh, processors. They may be single core, maybe dual core, not much more than that. And, uh, and so it's very important that not only that they can handle the uh, playback, smooth playback of HD video, but that they also don't, you know, wipe out the entire battery in, you know, trying to play back a, a, a two-hour movie. And so uh, what are the specs, basically, what are the acceptable specs of uh, media that you can play back in HTML5 and i9? So the file format that we support is the MP4 file format, also known as the MPEG-4 Part 14 specification. Uh, the video codec is H.264, also known as MPEG-4 AVC, and we support baseline, main, and high profiles uh, of H.264. Uh, of those, actually only main and high are, are hardware accelerated. Baseline is not because it's low complexity enough that it doesn't actually uh, need to be accelerated. Uh, and we support up to level 5.1 uh, of H.264. Uh, uh, on the audio side, we support the advanced audio codec, AAC. And uh, we support all major flavors of AC, which is uh, ACLC and HEAC, uh, both version 1 and version 2, uh, up to 48 kilohertz. Uh, and then as far as transfer of the media, we support, of course, uh, HTTP, aka progressive download. And we support both HTTP 1.0 and 1.1 uh, specifications. Uh, you really want to be using HTTP 1.1 uh, because that gives you the advantage of doing uh, instantaneous seeks. Basically, that allows by range uh, requests, and that allows you to seek anywhere in the media, even though you haven't downloaded the whole uh, media to your computer. So I'm going to do a quick demo of basically what GPU accelerated H.264 playback looks like in i9. So what I'm actually going to do first, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to disable uh, GPU acceleration in uh, i9 and uh, in order to do that if you go into tools you can actually uh, switch to the software rendering mode of i9 and so, so I'm going to go ahead I'm going to play back a video that's actually a 1080p full resolution uh, uh, video uh, encoded with really difficult complexity it's got if you're familiar with h264 it's encoded with kback and 7b frames and I think uh, 7 reference frames and so it's a pretty hardcore clip as far as complexity goes. And uh, I'm going to play it back. And uh, it might play back OK. Like you might see draw frames. You might not see draw frames. But the important part is that if you look at the, oh, I'm sorry, actually, let me restart this. Um, I forget that when I change the rendering mode, I need to uh, restart the browser. There we go, OK. So we're going to play it back. That. There we go. So it's a little Hawaii, choppy, as you can see. Uh, it's dropping frames, and if we look at the CPU consumption, we can actually see that it's using 90 to 100 percent of the CPU. So it's really taxing my CPU right now. It's pretty much creating a bottleneck uh, in the decode, and that's why it's dropping a whole lot of frames. You can see the video in the background is, is pretty choppy. Um, there's, a, there's a cool utility out there called uh, GPU-Z. Uh, it's a freeware utility if you look for it. Uh, online you'll find it pretty quickly. It's a free download. Uh, this will actually tell you how much of your GPU is being used. It's sort of the equivalent, equivalent of uh, looking at CPU usage. And right now you can see that we're not using very much of the GPU. We're only using, uh, let me zoom that in. See that number right there? That's basically we're only using about 10 to 15 percent of the GPU. So I'm going to minimize that, and uh, I'm going to close, oops, let me reopen that again. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to now uh, disable software rendering and uh, put it back on the default hardware accelerated uh, rendering and decode. And I'm going to restart the browser. I'm going to go back and play that video again. Now remember, that's a 1080p video, full resolution. Uh, I think uh, it's about 25 megabits per second. Uh, I'm playing this locally, uh, so it's, it's actually being able to uh, download it from my local machine. Uh, but it's definitely a very challenging video, video to play. And you can see now it's playing much smoother. Uh, I don't think it's dropping any frames at all. Um, and if we go look at uh, CPU consumption now, you can see that it's actually drop to 35, 20 percent. I mean, it's basically, it's, it's got, gone down to about one-third, one-quarter of what it used to be before. 
and it's not creating a bottleneck anymore either, so we're actually able to smoothly play it back without dropping frames. Uh, and then if we look at the, uh, oh, there it is. If we look at the GPU consumption, you can see that uh, we're actually using about 60 to 70 percent of the GPU right now. And that's because GPU is handling the decode. So that's more power efficient, and therefore that's actually using less battery uh, on my machine. All right. So uh, what does it take to actually build an HTML5 player? Uh, it's actually surprisingly easy, which is the point exactly of HTML5 video, and that's why a lot of people are excited about it. Um, this is all this code you see on the screen, um, and I'll zoom in a little bit if you can't see it. That's all it takes to build an HTML5 video player. Uh, a very basic player, of course, but that's all it takes. Uh, you'll probably, I'm sure you'll see uh, thousands, not thousands, but I'm sure you see dozens of uh, uh, demos like this at the conference because I'm sure everyone's going to be showing some H level 5 code, so get used to it. But this is basically all it takes. Uh, you basically just need to define a, a video element and uh, uh, define its width and height, and then uh, define a source for it, point it to a MP4 file on the server, insert some uh, little goo over here that defines the MIME type, which is uh, video slash MP4, the, define the codex, um, that's basically prefixed, you're always going to be using this for H.264 and ASC, and that's all it is. And, um, and that's your video player. Uh, of course, the devil is in the details. There's a lot more to it. Obviously, we wouldn't be having all these sessions about HTML5. Uh, there's a lot more complexity to it once you start getting into things like, you know, doing the fun stuff with the video, like uh, forming video walls and rotating it around and making it fly and, you know, uh, applying transforms to it and whatnot. Uh, and of course, uh, if you want to, um, if you want to do things like uh, rollover, uh, you know, automatically detect whether a client has Flash or Serialize or HTML5, and then pick the right appropriate player. There's more, de you know, there's more complexity in that. So, in order to alleviate some of that complexity, uh, we have a player framework uh, that we, uh, in the past, uh, we've, uh, you know, we started out by building a player framework for Serverlight. That was the, the first version of the, of the, of the Microsoft Media Platform player framework. And we did it because we actually did a number of projects where we would go and we would uh, 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 pay an outside agency, an external vendor, to go build us a player for a project. And they go and they spend several months building a player, and then we use it for like a week, and then we throw it in the trash. And then we go to the next project, and then hire another agency to do the same thing all over again. And after about you know three times, we realized that was uh, really not the most efficient way of spending our money. And so we decided, you know, we should actually just have a player framework that we can use for, you know, providing all the rich functionality that we need in the player. And for Serverlite, that's you know a lot of things because it's you know there's more functionality, and more features in Serverlite than there is in HTML5 as far as video playback goes. So the Serverlite player framework contains things like adaptive streaming support and DRM support and uh, and ad insertion and markers and captions and so on. Uh, we then went and extended that framework to the Windows Phone 7 platform as well, which is also Serverlite based, so it was a pretty easy port. And then uh, the latest uh, incarnation of the uh, player framework is the HTML5 player framework. And that's currently in what we're calling preview, uh, preview 2, I think, or beta 2 is uh, perhaps might be a better way to call it. Uh, and uh, that's going to be, uh, we're going to release version 1 uh, very soon. Uh, you can actually go and download already the betas uh, from playerframework.coplex.com. Uh, uh, what's in this HTML5 player framework? So one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that if you're familiar with the Serverlite version of the player framework, that you can interface uh, with the HTML5 player framework in a very similar way. And so we made sure that the JavaScript API was, is actually consistent with the Serverlite version so that it's very easy to switch between an HTML5 player and a Serverlite player. Uh, a part of that was also making sure that you can uh, implement a graceful rollover uh, between the two players. So if you want to deliver uh, adaptive streaming media, like smooth streaming, for example, to, uh, to a browser, uh, you need to deliver that to a serverlet player. 
Uh, and so we allow you to go and detect whether a person has a serverless player installed, and if they do, then that's the player that's going to get uh, uh, used. But if you're delivering just, for example, MP4 files from a HTTP server, then the HTML5 player might get used because that's the primary player for that. And so uh, that's the graceful, graceful rollover uh, uh, that we implemented. Um, you can also you can declare your player both statically as just markup. You can declare it. Uh, you can inject it into your uh, project just via JavaScript code. Uh, the player currently supports playlists. Uh, it's a pretty pl uh, pluggable architecture in there. Uh, the media and the controls is actually like the media sources and the controls are separate modules. Uh, we provide uh, it's it's fully skinnable, so you can use CSS to customize the controls. And then finally, we implemented uh, the full, sc uh, full screen control, which ironically is not a given in HTML5 video, uh, another thing that they didn't really quite think through, I think, in the spec. Um, but it is possible to do full screen playback in HTML5 video, and we do support that in the player framework. So a quick demo of what that looks like. Um, So here's a video, and so uh, as this plays back, you see that you basically have exactly what you would expect from your average video player. You have uh, your controls down here. Uh, they can go away if uh, they're not being used for a while. Uh, you have your, uh, your seek bar, you can seek within the video. You have your play pause here, uh, volume control, mute button, and of course, uh, if you need to go to full screen, you can actually go to full screen. So if we go and uh, just take a quick look at uh, the source code for this. Is that example adapted that you're playing, or is that just uh, this is a, No, this is just an MP4 video. So this is a, our HTML5 five player. And uh, let me see if I can. So this is this is this is the source code for that video player, and I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit better. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I essentially just uh, reference my player framework uh, JS right here, and uh, over up here is my video instantiation. I point it to my MP4 file. I give it a size, and down below here. Uh, I initialize my player, and that gives it the, the skinnable UI and things like the, the control bar that you see. That's the, the JavaScript code that you see down here. So all this, you know, if, if you're not uh, familiar with, with JavaScript and HTML5, you could probably very quickly build this player uh, on your own just by taking our JavaScript library, deploying on your web server, and essentially copy and pasting a little bit of code. So we plan to expand, of course, this player with many more features. We plan to add things like uh, closed captioning, subtitling, uh, uh, more you know, richer playlist support, and so on. Uh, so expect more features uh, to be added to, the, um, to this uh, player framework. This is just version one that we're releasing now. All right, so uh, now that we talked about the client, let's now take a step back. We're kind of working our way, as you can see, from the client back towards the server. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, expression encoder. Now, expression encoders are a, a video production tool for the web. Uh, it's, I would call it a prosumer uh, level uh, encoding tool. It's not, uh, it, it costs about $200 retail uh, and it's essentially used for uh, simple editing, uh, live encoding, GRM encryption. Uh, it supports also screen capture. Uh, and uh, if you are building a serverlet player, you can actually, it even provides player templates that let you deploy and publish a player immediately to the web that's a serverlet player. Uh, it supports closed captioning and, and many other features. It's a pretty flexible uh, encoder in terms of the inputs that it supports. It's based on uh, its input uh, um, source model is based on direct show and QuickTime. 
So if you have the right directional filters installed and if you have QuickTime installed, you can essentially import anything that you can play back in Media Player or play back in QuickTime Player and you can import any of that into uh, Expression Encoder. As far as its outputs, it supports uh, MP4 uh, files, so that's H.264 AAC uh, contain MP4 files. Uh, it supports uh, WMV out output Windows Media files, also known as ASF files, and that's with uh, the VC1 and WMA codecs. Uh, and then it supports uh, smooth streaming, and I'll talk about smooth streaming uh, a little bit later, uh, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, and that's and that can use a variety of codecs that can use any of the above, so H.264, VC1, AC, or WMA. Uh, there's actually a free download of uh, Expression Encoder. Uh, you can go and try it out for free. Uh, the free version uh, only includes VC1 and WMA support, so you can't actually author content for HTML5 using the free version of the encoder. You have to uh, purchase the retail version, which, like I said, is about $200 retail. And if you're uh, if you got volume licensing, you can probably get it for much cheaper. Um, so uh, just in case you're curious, uh, we use uh, main concepts uh, H.264 and AAC codecs uh, on the inside under the covers. Uh, we don't make our own; we actually just license main concepts. Uh, and uh, a part of uh, that uh, codec package is actually support also for hardware accelerated encoding which is a very cool feature. So we've supported this uh, since uh, Service Pack 1 for Expression Encoder 4 when we introduced uh, support for NVIDIA CUDA. Uh, and then uh, with Service Pack 2, which we just released last week, uh, we also added support for Intel SQB. What this means is that much like you have uh, uh, the ability on, in playback to offload uh, you know, all that work to the GPU and save, save your CPU some cycles, this allows you to leverage the GPU to accelerate the encoding of your video. Uh, and that's primarily beneficial uh, to cut down encoding times. So unlike playback, it's not about power consumption. This is about how do I accelerate the actual encoding of my video so they don't have to wait three hours for my 10-minute clip to finish. Uh, when you're encoding a video for uh, i9, you know, obviously uh, you have to concern certain things. Uh, and um, Today, a vast majority of PCs that are running IE9, that are capable of running IE9, have GPUs that are capable of decoding uh, H.264. And so, if you actually want to deliver the best quality video to IE9 uh, using Expression Encoder, you can, I recommend that you encode using H.264 high profile to give you that best quality because it's going to get offloaded to the GPU anyway. Uh, so you might as well just plan for the best quality rather than, you know, for the lowest common denominator uh, in case, you know, the three PCs that can handle it can play it. Uh, the rule of thumb, uh, in case you're wondering, okay, what can I actually play back in IE9 as far as my H.264 video? The rule of thumb is that if you can play back in Windows Media Player and Windows 7, you can probably play back in the browser as well because it uses essentially the same codecs and the same code path to do the decoding and the rendering as Media Player does. So that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 100% uh, true, but uh, it's it's a rule of thumb. Uh, so if you want to know more about what exactly the Windows 7 uh, decoders uh, support uh, in terms of you know, what exact flavors of H.264 and AAC, uh, you can go and check out the Windows 7 codec documentation online on MSDN. And I provided a link for you uh, in case you want to read up more on that. So I have some best practices uh, that I typically, some guidelines that I use when I encode a video for, uh, for uh, HTML5 or, or Servlight or Flash for that matter, in fact, because today uh, Servlight and Flash are also provide hardware accelerated H.264 decoding. So you can't really lose. Essentially, if you use H.264, it's going to get accelerated regardless of whether you use HTML5, Flash, or Servlight. So I recommend, like I said, that you use high-profile uh, H.264. Uh, I recommend that you use KBAC entropy encoding. That's a high-complexity uh, encoding mode for H.264. Uh, and you can use um, three, three B frames. That's typically like a good uh, uh, target number, uh, about five reference frames. Uh, and then if you have the option of using uh, uh, reference B frames or adaptive B frames, I recommend that as well. Uh, Typically, when you encode for adaptive streaming, we don't recommend using scene change detection. But for uh, HTML5, we recommend that you do because you can actually get more efficient encoding if you use scene change detection. 
And because there's no multiple bit rates, there's no need to align actual GOPs and keyframes. So it's, uh, uh, it's recommended they use and change uh, detection for uh, HTML5. Uh, and you can see a screenshot here of what those advanced settings look like um, in expression encoder. And in fact, for my next demo, I'm going to show you how to encode a piece of video in expression encoder. So this is expression encoder for service Mac 2. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to show you very quickly how to do this. Uh, so we just click on the import button and we import a piece of media in here. I'm just going to import the short clip. And uh, expression encoder, like I said, allows you to do some simple editing. So if you need to like trim the video, uh, set some in and out points and things like that, you can do that uh, using just expression encoder. Uh, but we're going to skip that and we're just going to go straight to encoding. There's a number of presets up here that you can use. And uh, we haven't had the chance to update the UI and say, including HTML5, but if you basically target Serverlight, with H.264 encoding, that's, that will work uh, in uh, HTML5 as well. So if you want to just use a quick preset, just go to encoding for Serverlight, H.264, and you have your option whether you use constant bit rate or variable bit rate. Since we use in progressive download for HTML5, you might as well use variable bit rate because it gives you higher quality. You can use two-pass uh, VBR, and that will give you better quality overall. Uh, and with progressive download, uh, it's uh, it's Progressive download tends to react to uh, a variable bit rate uh, a lot better than, uh, uh, for example, streaming. So, for example, uh, we might go and pick this uh, HD 720p VBR uh, preset. And then if we go and expand our video section down here, that will give us access to all the... Oops, going on? There we go. Um, that will give us access to all the advanced settings of uh, the video. And so there's uh, typical stuff in here such as bit rate uh, and resolution. Uh, you notice up here there's a place to adjust the keyframe interval. Uh, for, uh, for progressively downloaded video, unlike for adaptive streaming video, you don't need to have uh, short chunks. There's no need to have like a keyframe every two seconds, for example, like there is with adaptively streaming video. For progressively downloaded video, you can insert keyframes every five seconds or every 10 seconds. If you're using scene change detection, the keyframes will probably get inserted uh, more frequently than that anyway. Uh, so 10 seconds is actually like a pretty decent number. Uh, and then if you really uh, want to tweak the, the settings for um, H.264, you can expand this section down here, and that gives you that advanced uh, look advanced overview of the H.264 setting. So we can go in here and say things like, okay, I want to use five uh, reference frames. I want to use uh, three B frames. Uh, I want to use, you know, uh, actually I'll leave this in speed so it goes faster. And we're going to use reference B frames and adaptive B frames and scene change detection. And for our audio, we're going to use 128-bit uh, audio. All right, and once we're done, we can go over here in our uh, output panel. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and disable the interlacing for this clip because it's not, it's progressive uh, video. And I'm going to set my uh, uh, output folder here. And that's it. And so we're going to go and hit encode. And on, this is my laptop, so I don't have a good GPU on this, so we can't take advantage of GPU accelerated encoding on this. So this is just using CPU. And you can see uh, up here that uh, this is going to take about a minute and a half, basically, to encode this, uh, uh, whatever it is, 20 second, 30 second clip. Uh, so I'm going to cancel that. We don't need to uh, actually wait for the minute and a half. I'm sure you have better things to do. Uh, but that's how simple it is to encode the video for HTML5 using an expression encoder. Let's see, let me just check how we're doing on time. Okay.
All right, so we talked about the client and we talked about the encoder. So you know how to play back the video and you know how to encode the video. So let's talk about how do you actually deliver the video and what can you get out of the Microsoft Media Platform on the delivery side. So Internet Information Services, aka IIS, is our uh, web server for Windows Server. Uh, it's available in all the Windows Server uh, 2008 SKUs, including like the cheapest one, which is actually called Windows Web Server. Uh, and the latest version right now is IS 7.5 for the Server 2008 R2 release. Uh, what a lot of people don't know that IIS is actually available for Windows clients as well. So if you have a Windows 7 machine or a Windows Vista machine, you can actually install IIS on that machine. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll show you right now uh, where to do it in case you've never done it. Uh, it's kind of a hidden thing. If you go to uh, Programs and Features, and you go to turn Windows features on and off, you can actually see that you can go and check this checkbox right there for Internet Information Services, and that will actually install Web Server on your Windows 7 machine. And that's useful if, you just, if you're doing some development or if you're doing some uh, demos and you don't need a full Web Server, this is kind of useful. Um, and all the extensions that I'm going to talk about in a second, those work on the IIS version that installs on Windows 7 as well. So you actually, if you just, like I said, if you're doing demos, you don't even need a server OS. But obviously you do for, for important stuff. Uh, so IIS Media Services is a set of IIS 7 extensions that enhance delivery of media, specifically over HTTP networks. Um, so if you go to httpis.net slash media, you can download IS Media Services there for free, uh, both for x86 and x64 uh, versions of the server, uh, of IS that is. Uh, and uh, what IS Media Services are is there's, a, there's essentially a set of features, like I said, that enhance delivery of media. The most famous one uh, that you probably uh, have heard about is smooth streaming. That's our HTTP adaptive streaming technology that uh, enables adaptive streaming of live and on-demand video. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, adaptive streaming is not a part of the HTML5 specifications, so you can't, unfortunately, use smooth streaming to deliver to HTML5 clients. Uh, somebody will probably ask, well, why not? Just extend the browser. Well, we could, but then we would be essentially be going beyond the HTML5 specifications. So in all likelihood, not. Uh, so right now, you can't use smooth streaming to deliver media to an HTML5 browser. Uh, another feature that's a part of uh, IS Media Services is web playlists. And this is if you want to hide the location of your media assets on the server. It essentially allows you to obfuscate the URL so you can't see uh, what the media is and where it is on the server. And this can be used for HTML5. And then finally, a feature of IS Media Services is uh, called bitrate throttling. And this is the one that I'm going to talk about in more detail because this is one that's most useful for HTML5 uh, delivery of video. What bitrate throttling is, it's really a cost-saving bandwidth control feature. So you probably have all uh, you know, seen that scenario. You've probably done this yourselves. You, know, you go to YouTube or a site like that that, you know, that does progressive download of the video. Uh, and you go and you start playing some video that looks interesting to you. And uh, as you start playing, you know, maybe you're on a, on a FiOS, uh, on a really fast connection, uh, or maybe you're on CorpNet. But basically, you have a really fast connection, and uh, the, you see the progress bar, you know, the download bar on the player fill up really quickly because, you know, as you start playing the video, the entire video downloads, uh, you know, within, let's say, like five or ten seconds. Um, you start watching the video, and then, you know, after about five or ten seconds, you realize, you know, it's not such an interesting video, and so you decide to give up on it, and you go watch something else. But unfortunately, because you have a fast connection, the entire video has actually downloaded to your machine uh, in the time that you, you know, in the five, ten seconds you spend watching the video. Why is that a bad thing? That's a bad thing because the, the provider that's hosting that video, that's actually uh, giving you, providing you the video, is paying for the bandwidth and paying for the hosting. So they're paying for the fact that they delivered you, let's say, uh, 100 megabytes of video, but you only watched 10 megabytes of that video. So that's an issue. Uh, and so in order to actually cut costs for the providers, uh, we have a feature called bitrate throttling. And what it does is it automatically detects the encoded bitrate of a media file 
and then throttles the bandwidth, the actual speed at which the server delivers the file to just that encoded bit rate. So despite the fact that I might have a 100 megabit connection to the internet, if I'm playing back a file that's encoded at two megabits, the server will actually serve it to me only at two megabits per second. Uh, and this is, this is flexible and this is extensible, so I can actually go and configure how I do it. Uh, and we support a variety of popular file types such as WMA, WMV, MP4, and so on. And among them, we also support MP4 files as well. So MP4 file support is built into uh, uh, bitrate throttling already. If you want to extend it to other uh, HTML5 uh, uh, file types, such as, for example, WebM, uh, you can do that. There's uh, basically an XML schema that you just have to go define and kind of tell bitrate throttling where to look for uh, bitrate information in the file header itself. And once you define that, it can go and do the same thing for WebM files as well. So I'm going to do a quick demo. In fact, actually, rather than do a demo, Actually, I will, I will go ahead and do a demo. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my cache just to make sure we're not pulling it directly from the cache. All right, so let me see if we can make this happen. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video from my server. I already have Bitrate Throttling enabled. All right, excellent. So one thing that you might have noticed is if we zoom in, this is my network activity. And you notice this sort of like peak that happened where basically it surged at the very beginning. And then you notice that we have a more consistent delivery of media afterwards. If we go back, and if you actually look at my progress bar down here, you notice that, so I don't know if you can see that from up there, it's kind of a, just a different shade really, but um, my current seek bar, my current seek position is right here, this is where I'm playing, and this is how much I've downloaded so far. So even though I'm playing back this file from my local server and really it should just kind of download entirely right away to my browser cache, my server is only actually letting out just slightly more, just slightly, it's giving me just slightly ahead of where I am right now because it's looking at the encoded bit rate of the file and just giving me just slightly more of that video. So as I'm playing here, this is actually only how much I've downloaded so far from my local server running on this machine and that's because I have bit rate throttling enabled. So if I stop watching this video right now, I haven't wasted the bandwidth of delivering the entire file, I've only basically delivered this very small chunk of file, this you know, one minute or so. Uh, and so there's another uh, feature of IS Media Services that I just want to talk about last, uh, and that's the Transfer Manager. Uh, which is currently in beta. Uh, we should be releasing it fairly soon, uh, the version 1.0. And it's a very uh, interesting, useful feature if you're running a service that basically uh, transcodes videos where you know, people submit you videos and you need to transcode those for publishing to the web. Uh, because the transfer manager, what it does is actually it allows you to automatically transcode videos on the server uh, unattended. Uh, it uses expression encoder on the back end that can be actually extended to use third-party encoders as well, but by default it uses expression encoder. And the way it functions is by monitoring watch folders. So you can go and define a watch folder that says, anytime a video file is dropped into this folder, I want to go use this encoding preset, and then I want to go copy the output to this folder over here. So you can essentially go in there and say and define an MP4 encoding preset, encoding task, and then any file you drop into that folder will get transcoded to uh, an H.264 MP4 file. So rather than doing it manually, this is a very uh, easy way of automating that task. Uh, it's fully scalable, so it can be used on uh, uh, HPC clusters. Uh, and it supports custom tasks and task chaining. So for example, and this would be outside of the context of HTML5, but if you want to do something like 
transcode the same video to MP4 and smooth streaming, you could do that with chain tasks. You could then also add a DRM protection task on top of that so that the smooth streaming asset gets DRM encrypted as well. And then you could even, uh, for example, take the MP4 file and uh, transmux that to, uh, for example, to an HLS file as well for delivery to iOS devices. So these are all features of the Transfer Manager, and you can essentially do this all as a sort of a, a chain set of tasks uh, for, on a single source file. Uh, and uh, like I said earlier, only the, the MP4 task would really apply to the HTML5 scenario here, but that's something that you can do as well. And so finally, just uh, a word about uh, Windows 8. Uh, the HTML5 development skills that you've been uh, working on for so long, uh, they will actually be directly applicable to building Windows 8 apps, uh, Windows 8 Metro apps. Uh, I won't give you too much information about this because we've actually talked about it a lot at a recent uh, Windows Build conference uh, that was down here in California about two months ago. So there's two excellent sh uh, sessions at that conference that are available online. You can watch them and I recommend that you watch them to talk about uh, Windows 8 Metro and, and media and how you essentially build, build media apps for Windows 8 and how HTML5 fits into that whole thing. So that is the end of my session. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, and I'm going to open it up for questions now. Uh, and I think it's a pretty small room, so you can just kind of shout it out if you have questions. Go ahead. We, we, we have no plans to announce right now about um, porting Serverlight to, to iOS or anything like that. But you know, ultimately, it's not even necessarily just up to us because iOS is, is uh, Apple's product. So they, they kind of control really what goes into that. So you don't support Android, but you Correct, yeah. And, and you also said that it also supports video. Right. Uh, that, that's a very good question. I, I, think, I, I think there's you know, obviously some drawbacks to the plugin approach because it requires an additional download and so on. And so um, you know, um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that right now. Uh, so one of the things to, to actually also consider is that, and that's actually, thank you for asking that because you reminded me of something else that I was going to bring up. Uh, so, so adaptive streaming is, is a question that gets asked very frequently about HTML5 because it's obviously uh, a big sort of hole in the whole HTML5 video story is that the lack of adaptive streaming. And right now what we have is we kind of have the market fragmented between uh, three proprietary technologies. We have uh, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, we have Apple HLS, and we have Adobe HTTP Dynamic Streaming that are essentially the three dominant adaptive streaming technologies. And I think there's actually a light at the end of the tunnel uh, because right now uh, we're about a month away probably from uh, a spec being published from MPEG called MPEG Dash. Uh, and MPEG Dash is MPEG uh, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. Uh, and that is uh, an effort actually in the industry uh, uh, to, to come put together uh, a uniform adaptive streaming spec for the industry. Uh, and actually all the companies that I mentioned are actually on board of that, or at least were contributing to that specification. So Microsoft was involved with that, Apple was involved with that. A lot of other companies such as Akamai, Qualcomm, a lot of consumer electronics companies were involved with that. So I'm hoping that rather than go down this path of you know, adding proprietary extensions to browsers for you know, the proprietary uh, adaptive stream technologies, we can all kind of get on board the MPEG Dash train and really uh, uh, you know, start looking at supporting that in the browsers. Uh, and that, you know, a part of that will probably have to go through W3C, obviously, if we want to get it formally into the HTML5 spec. But even if we can get the consensus amongst the companies, uh, we might see just sort of voluntary adoption of MPEG Dash in browsers as well. <laughs>